And the third and final presentation this afternoon is going to be delivered by Vivienne Wee, uh, who's an anthropologist who has done extensive field research in Singapore and Indonesia. Her uh, PhD in anthropology is uh, from the Australian National University. She's also the co-founder of Ethnographica Private Limited, which is dedicated to ethnographic research on social development, community engagement, um, heritage conservation, cultural mapping, linguistic documentation, and other related fields. Um, her presentation that she's giving today is called Local Custodians of Pulau Ubin's Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. I, I hope that um, you're still awake after a long day and that um, uh, this talk will still hold your attention. So um, we've discussed the ICH convention already. I just want to uh, reinforce that communities are quite central to um, this whole convention and it's mentioned in many articles, which I will not repeat. Um, and in fact, today, what I want to stress is the imp importance of communities in the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage. So this morning, we had the um, keynote uh, address by Professor Wang Gang Wu on heritage and history. And I just want to uh, say a bit more about that. And also some of the points that I'm going to say now and later have been also said. I just want to reinforce it that what is important is not just the relationship of people to their past, but the continuation of past into present. So I was quite struck by Professor Liu just now that what was included as ICH in Hong Kong doesn't just include memory of what used to happen in the past, but it's something that is living and that is something that is actively practiced. So um, the last point here is that Communities transmit heritage across generations as shared culture. And what this means is that this is their way of life. And, and sometimes it's just unconscious uh, practices that they have just been doing and they don't necessarily see it as heritage and suddenly this thing, this bracketing comes in, this framing of something as heritage, which is something that um, we should think about. Um, this has also been uh, discussed. What continues? What changes? What does this continue? Who decides? And who maintains the continuity through time? And very often the two who's are not the same people. So the decision maker may not be the person or the people who are maintaining the continuity through time. So very often we find um, tension around the relationship. And as was mentioned also just now uh, by a, a, one of the speakers, all decisions are also political decisions in the sense that they involve relations of power. What is a community? Well, I want to first make the point what a community is not. It's not a collection of uninhabited wooden houses. And there has been a tendency especially in the early days of the heritage movement to look at tangible heritage. So there has been this tendency to look at tangible heritage, the house, the structure as heritage. But if it is just uninhabited and it is devoid of meaning, then as uh, Professor Liu said, it's not just a performance or display, it's just an empty structure. And it's not a population of unconnected residents. Here I want to build on the point that Professor Liu has made. Professor Liu identified ICH as knowledge in people's minds. But I would add to that and say that it's not just knowledge in people's minds, but knowledge that they share with one another. In other words, there is a social interaction going on and not just isolated individuals, each individually having knowledge. So here, I want to draw on a, con a concept, um, a differentiation that was made by a sociologist in the 19th century in 1887, um, where he differentiated between two forms of social organization. One is Gemeinschaft, which can be translated as local community, where relationships are small scale, personal, and particularistic. That means it's like, you know, in your family, your mother is your mother. It's not just a generic mother, okay? Um, Gazelle Shaf is a broader society 
where relationships are large scale, impersonal and universalistic. So if you are occupying a certain job, you have a certain occupation, you have a certain role, then that tends to be somewhat um, impersonal, like I speak as a civil servant and are occupying this office. So that's what Gesellschaft is. So I make the argument that uh, maintaining a Gemeinschaft com community is really important for safeguarding cultural heritage. Earlier on, Kevin Tan said, uh, spoke about communities and he was saying, you know, who has the right to decide for the community? The, the form has one signature, who is this person in the community? And that's really something that we also need to consider. So here, I want to make the argument that the cultural significance of a Gemeinschaft community is that there are these people who are bound to each other not just to their ancestors, but to each other in the contemporary time through small-scale, personal and particularistic relationships. So they are per persons known to each other, okay, and, and they are not impersonal. And this means that the transmission of cultural heritage as knowledge is through in interpersonal relationships, not just through impersonal means like books, instruction manuals, classroom, Training, training workshop, websites, you can add to this list, 3D scanning and so on. Okay, just a little comment about the 3D scanning. Um, I was struck by how, you know, the, the 3D scanning of this nativity church in Bethlehem didn't show a single person. I mean, this was a church. Didn't people go and worship there? Weren't there festivals there? So what was it as a social institution? We didn't see anything of that. Of course, it was an architectural presentation, but I think for the preservation of heritage, we need to see buildings and structures, not just as architectural structures, but as social institutions. And this is what I am going to talk about. And, and this has been noted before um, by Bukanaki, and I quote him that, intangible heritage is intimately related to its creators as it depends in most cases on oral transmission. And again, this point has been made also in our discussion about the need to talk to the people who are involved in the practice. Now, when we say oral transmission, we willingly must imply interpersonal relationships because there is a speaker, there is a listener, they must share some understanding in order to communicate with each other and there will be interactions with them. Okay, so the five uh, manifestations of intangible cultural heritage all need social context and as Professor Liu said, these are things that happen in everyday life and in everyday life, everything we do, even if we are sitting in front of a computer, all need social context. So I want to make the point that safeguarding intangible cultural heritage means safeguarding the social context within which those uh, ICH manifestations are practiced. I now like to move to Pula Ubin as a case study of how intangible cultural heritage is embedded in a social context. This is a project that our team uh, Ethnographica is working on um, for the National Heritage Board, and we've been doing it since um, May last year. So, um, we have uh, the earliest written documentation of habitation on Pulau Ubin, 1825, but actually, we may surmise that um, Pulau Ubin was inhabited uh, longer than that, because you can see that Pulau Ubin, um, which is here, is just at the mouth of the Johor River. And the Johor River was the site of the Malay Sultanate way back in the 18th century, seven, even some parts of the 17th century. Later on, there were some um, industrial developments like coffee plantations and granite quarries. So at this peak, the population was like 2,000 to 4,000, this is quite a wide range, but the, the um, how does it, census was not very accurate. And even now, after the quarries have closed down, and we know that there is a dwindling population, I, I put question marks uh, on the blue uh, figures because these are not verified figures. Okay, so, so what's the 
cultural significance of this small island in the Singaporean context. First of all, it is one of, last, of the last two kampongs or settlements. So one is on Pulau Ubin. So there were several settlements on the island, but now um, they're kind of all regarded as just Pulau Ubin. Uh, the other kampong, the other settlement, um, uh, is uh, Kampong Buangkok, which is um, on a much smaller scale than Pulau Ubin. And what we find in Singaporean discourse, for those of you who are familiar with Singapore, uh, to quote the Prime Minister, we talk often about bringing back to Singapore the kampong spirit. Okay, so what is this kampong spirit? So another uh, minister, uh, Lawrence Wong, has actually characterized it. What life was like in the kampong, a bonding experience. Uh, gotong royong, meaning mutual support. People coming together, working together, um, helping to keep the kampong spirit alive. So this is kind of like re people regenerating uh, kampong culture for themselves. So what is significant about Pulau Ubin is that we find this kampong spirit, which is um, being act actively revitalized, or at least efforts are made in that direction. We find this kampong spirit anchored in what remains of a kampong. So we not only are trying to revive some uh, detached, you know, uh, non-localized kampong spirit, but we actually have localized kampong spirit. So let's see what that looks like. So this is current Ubin, and there are only two sites, one which has the outward bound school, and the other is a campsite of the National Police Cadet Corps. Only these two sites are out of bounds. The rest are open to residents and visitors. The whole island, however, is owned by the state. Okay, so um, in the last 10 years, the state has kind of uh, taken ownership of the land. However, there are still uh, people living on the island. So currently, there are 91 houses and structures, including some that are unnumbered, listed and photographed by um, the National Heritage Board. Oh, I have, still have the Urban uh, Renewal Authority, it's now called Urban Redevelopment and National Parks. And each has a named tenant. Now the thing is, Actually, in Singapore, most people don't live alone. So if you had uh, 91 people all living alone by themselves as isolated individuals, the Ministry of Social and Family Development would be quite concerned. So we actually have houses occupied by families. So if you have 91 houses occupied not just by 91 individuals, but 91 families consisting of at least two people, we should be thinking of more than 91 people. Okay, a conservative, conservatively, perhaps 150. Okay, so now I'm going to look at ICH manifestations on Pulau Ubin. So these are the five manifestations that are in the convention. Um, I have highlighted the last three because I'm going to start with that, but I'm going to return to number one and number two. Uh, I, I don't know what has happened here. Okay, this is a bit messed up, but anyway, uh, we'll live with the mess. The first part is a quotation um, about Gotong Royong as mutual support. So what uh, one Ubin resident said was that in the past, we villagers would get together to build a house and neighbors would work together and that, that was how it was. And quite interestingly, there is also something called the Ubin Way. Now the Ubin Way, was actually drawn up by nature lovers, grassroots leaders, uh, Ubin operators, educators, and volunteers. And they have five principles, mainly for visitors, about reliving and experiencing the kampong lifestyle, uh, discovering and cherishing, cherishing the diversity of nature, respecting one another, and the respect also, the word respect is in the convention, and it was also highlighted by Professor Liu. And quite interestingly, the Ubin Way is promoted by the Ministry of National Development. So, um, I don't know whether the Ubin Way will also be practiced um, on the mainland, as Singapore is called. But anyway, on the island, visitors are supposed to adhere to the Ubin Way. Okay, so now I want to um, go to these uh, manifestations of uh, 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 intangible cultural heritage. And I want to start with 
uh, ritual and festive events. So I want to tell you about this annual festival that happens on Ubin. It is the festival of the Ubin Tuape Kong, who, who, who is, uh, I suppose you can translate him as grand uncle. I want to make the point that ICH occurs, or intangible culture, uh, culture uh, occurs in a social context. So there are some elements here that I want to highlight. First of all, it's a six-day celebration. So this, these photos are all taken from uh, last year, 31st May to 5th of June. Now, in Singapore, there is no other place, there's no other temple where you can have a six-day celebration. Nobody would have the time. So this is Ubin, and you have to take a boat to get there, and yet they have a six-day celebration. Another element is processions, processions from different parts of the island. Then there's music, which happens. Like throughout the festival, there's music going on all the time, and I'm just giving example of three instruments here. Uh, there's spirit mediumship. Spirit mediumship does occur yeah, in Singapore as well, but we have uh, you know, specific manifestations of spirit mediumship there. Then we have Teochew Opera on one of Singapore's last two permanent Chinese opera outdoor stages. Uh, the, the other one is uh, on Balestia Road. We have Gertai, and then we have Lion Dance. Now, some of these uh, elements are not unique most of these elements are not unique to Ubin, but the whole combination of elements, I would say, is unique to Ubin. This is where the sum is greater than its parts. Okay? So we see this procession, and uh, this, the Topikong has a temple in the kind of downhill area, in the main area. Uh, this, is the, this is the opera stage at the, at the back. And the images have come down from the hill, this is the tiger god, and the tiger god is not being very active, so people are carrying it in a very kind of uh, state way. But you can see this, this guy who is carrying this, and this is Topik Gong. He is kind of like dancing around because Topik Gong is a much mo uh, more powerful deity, and he is um, exerting or manifesting his power. Okay, then there's ritual focus on the temple. So people dress up for the occasion. So we had different groups of people. They you know, have their own uh, procession to go to the temple. They pray. And here is an opera uh, performer. And here he's doing it. He's praying to Topikong in the temple as himself, as an individual, not part of a ceremony which we will see later. Now, I have this slide here to show that Intangible cultural heritage gives meaning to the tangible heritage. So the temple is not just a building. So when we conserve tangible heritage, we need to conserve, conserve it as sites of meaning, not just as structures that are devoid of meaning and that can be gentrified. So I make the point that gentrification is not um, true conservation in the full sense of the word. Okay, I have mentioned that there, there's music and there's opera going on. Um, now, I make this point because, you see, these, these performers, they are performing in a social context. The, this guy, he's actually facing the main altar, and he's performing uh, the, the sona at a particular point in this uh, ritual ceremony. So you can't just pluck him out and ask him to play in a concert hall. Right? So when we look at those five manifestations, when we say performing art, are we saying, you know, do, do we have the social context of the performance in our mind, or we think that performing art means that you can just pluck it out of the context and put it into a concert hall? The concert hall itself is a social context. Okay, here's the Teochew Opera. Okay, then another very important part of um, this whole ceremony is intersectionality, which is where there is a mingling of domains. So right before the actual opera is performed, the opera performers uh, dress up, and then you can see uh, this is the god of opera, the opera god. Then the opera performers come down to the main temple, and they are paying their respects to Topic Gong. And then this little doll, which is now held in 
this opera performer's hand, and they are actually dressed as the scholar and the scholar's wife, will actually place the opera god on the altar so that the opera god can also watch the opera. So this opera, again, can you just pluck it out and put it in a concert hall? Okay, I mean, you know, where's the opera, uh, opera god supposed to sit? So I, I just want to make this uh, point that we have to understand the social context. That this doesn't mean that worlds cannot mingle, because I just want to draw attention to this woman in shorts. She's there as a cyclist. She's there to just rent a cycle and go biking in, on Ubin, and she's not bothered by, uh, by this uh, festival going on. And the people who are involved in the festival are also not bothered by her. Okay, so the, the worlds can also mingle. So one of the, one of the, what I would consider as complexities is not so much differentiation, but bringing together different domains, different dimensions, bringing it together. And you, you find that throughout the ceremony, many things are happening at the same time. And if sometimes it's very difficult to know like which is the uh, more important event or what is the less important event because they're all happening simultaneously. Uh, uh, just now, Professor Liu was talking about how you can't attend all the uh, celebrations of the same God in all the temples. Sometimes you don't know which is the event you should uh, attend within the same ceremony. Then we have spirit mediumship, which is another part of this topic Gong festival. And these are underworld gods. So this, this particular god up there, he's the Lord's second uh, brother. And, he, and there's another procession. He comes down from another temple, which is uh, located some distance away. And there is a procession with uh, a crowd of people to go to the main temple. And this is actually a personification of the tiger god. And then to finish off the six-day event, they then have this Gertai, which is this uh, outdoor performance of Chinese pop songs, you know, in Mandarin, Hokkien, some Indonesian song. At the same time, they have a lion dance at the same time, okay? Um, and again, you, you have to run to and fro. And I just have this uh, kind of backstage shot to show you that some very young people are also involved in these uh, activities. And here they are actually well, uh, waiting to welcome uh, the Member of Parliament, so they are at a jetty. And, and then it hasn't ended yet. So then after the MP goes home, they have a ritual by the sea. So there is a practice concerning nature. So they have it right on the beach. They have it right and they make offerings to the sea spirits who have decided to also attend the festivities. Okay, and as I was saying, there's music throughout. And at the end, there's another sonar player. And this is um, the, uh, the, the scene where Topikong goes back to the hill temple. So you see, it's a very complicated, very complex um, sequence of events involving many elements uh, which come together in a particular sequence. So if we start dismantling it, and we say, okay, uh, relocate, move to a HDB area, the sea doesn't matter, then you have already lost a very important part of your sequence. Then what's the next thing you're going to cut out? You can start cutting out one thing after another and you're left with nothing. Okay, um, next I'll talk about knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe. Akuma. Okay, so I'll just show a very short video. Um, this one, yeah, just now that one.我这个做排水是跟水草跑的早的话以前六点我就出门那么迟的话有时候下午三点我才出门因为看水草每天啊以前有不一的时候我要整理我的衣物我有洗衣服我有煮饭海上服务偶尔也坏我要修理他在钓鱼我去卖螃蟹就碰到了他就跟他爸爸讲他有水头螃蟹要我叫他爸爸问我我就说可以了我跟他爸爸讲嘛家里选
最旧的衣服，而且最好是残酷，因为我红树林里面有,有很多蚊子。当然了，现在我带他走，有些地方我也不敢带，有些地方死很多，定更不要跟我走一些一段时间，因为他现在太小，我看要多一两年，而且他也蛮乖的啦。尽可能保留吧，像这种刚崩的地方，这里好像剩下，这是最后一个，已经没有了。这边如果啦发展了，新加坡就没有乡村了。到城市去住很辛苦啊，又热又不知道要去哪里。这种刚崩，外面的人来了他不懂走哪里，反而我很多地方可以走，我可以到山里面找野果啦，嗯、啊。有榴莲季节，我可以进山去找榴莲。山里面，你有兴趣的话，的话有很多东西可以看。有些人没兴趣，他看的你跟他讲的，他也没有兴趣听。要你要对这些山里面的花草有兴趣，树木。Yes, fine. Uh, our ethnographic team is actually making a 20-minute video, but I decided to show you the, 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 video, the short video that's made by Today, which is one of the Singapore newspapers, uh, because um, this video, which has a readership for this newspaper, is already reaching out to a kind of mainstream crowd. Um, so I thought you know, it might be interesting to see whether the, the Ubin way is actually penetrating the consciousness of um, people in Singapore. Another uh, person I'd like to talk about is Li Hua, who is the protector and observer of wildlife. So she has a special relationship with hornbills. Uh, so in fact, Anne Parks did this book calling her uh, the grandmother of hornbills. So, and, and it's a particular family of hornbills. So this is, um, the, the, the hornbills are pair, bo pair bonded. So every year, the same pair goes and they actually nest in this, in this bird nest, bird's nest um, in her garden and, and produce a batch of young. And, and then she, she kind of uh, identifies with them and talks to them. Okay, then uh, where traditional craftsmanship is concerned, there are 91 houses that have been listed and photographed, so I'm not going to do 91 houses. But the houses all have a named builder. So, I mean, do you know who built your house? Do you, do you know the name of the builders? Do you even know the name of the company? Of course we don't, because it's all impersonal. But on Ubin, you still have personalized house building, where people know this was the house that Apiang built, this plank was put there by somebody. So there is intimate knowledge of the houses and the parts of the houses. This part, uh, my father put in, this part my brother put in, and you get stories of houses. Apart from houses, they also make fishing platforms. Now these uh, fishing platforms, um, the far left, now, what is interesting is that they are not rafts, okay? They are fishing platforms, which means that they are actually anchored into the sea. It's not so easy to build this into the sea so that it doesn't float with the tide. It's just, it stays there. These were the people who used to live in Pongol. And uh, Akyang, who is the crab catcher that you just watched, he's one of the uh, Geelong people who have resettled from Pongo, which used to have one of the oldest settlements in Singapore. So as Akyang says, now that I have no Keelong and no village, where would I go? I can't go to the city. There's nothing else I know how to do except to fish. And so he has moved to Ubin. And one of the things that he has done, apart from this house that you saw in the video, which is actually his friend's house, he has built this fishing platform. And this other platform that you see in the background is actually the platform built by his sister, um, who is, I think, in her 70s, but she has not even been to land in Ubin. And of course, Akyang knows all kinds of um, uh, building craftsmanship, but he, he, he can make uh, fishing traps and he makes all his uh, uh, crabbing hooks, which is a, a way of catching crabs in a very uh, sustainable way. I'm now into my last uh, PowerPoint, which is that 
if we want to think about how to conserve inter, uh, intangible cultural heritage, we need to think about conserving Ubin as a social context, and we need to co uh, conserve the Ubin social network as conservators. So as we have seen, the tangible and intangible cultural heritage are closely linked. So people's knowledge, understanding and practices give meaning. They give meaning to what is around them that you can see that is tangible. So it's not good enough to just put up a plaque, this was the house of so-and-so, or to just have a memory, oh, uh, my grandfather used to live there. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's memory, that's not safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. Now, memory is also worth remembering um, for certain reasons, but it cannot take the place of you know, safeguarding and conserving uh, living and continuing in uh, cultural heritage. So um, what we're presenting here is how the social uh, network of Ubin, consisting of present and former residents and other stakeholders, Co uh, constitute an, a community that is conserving their shared culture. And this shared culture is not unique only to Ubin, it also draws in people from outside, okay? And therefore, Pulau Ubin is a social context for conservation of intangible cultural heritage and not just a geographical site. Thank you. <laughs>